to be here with you this afternoon. I, I must admit I always enjoy coming to, to the fountain, um, fountain in the city, I should say. And uh, yeah, it really is coming home, home for me in, in so many ways. Uh, not that I've been a member here for, you know, for any length of time, but um, certainly know the mission that you, you have here at um, UTS. And uh, what I want to share with you this afternoon is a bit of a, bit of a kind of journey, a spiritual journey of discovery um, that, I, that I've had myself personally, which I, is really great. I, I sort of think of it like a sort of Sherlock Holmes. Does anybody like Sherlock Holmes here? It's sort of like, you know, um, you, know you get to the point and, and uh, Dr. Watson asks the difficult question and, and Sherlock says, it's, it's trivial, it's um, trivial, Dr. Watson. Um, and it's, it's really, really amazing. So um, you're, um, we'll be diving into the Bible. So, you know, you definitely have it on your phone or, or the, your book version of it. Uh, but we just want to really kind of journey together um, here um, this afternoon. We do live on a very beautiful planet, don't we? When you, when you um, look out at space, that's, that's Australia there. You might almost be able to see Sydney. Uh, but they... You know, when they go to, to the moon, they call it the blue marble, uh, looking back at, back at our planet. Uh, but there's some fascinating things about, um, you know, we live in, a, in an age where everything needs to be instant. Everything needs to be fast. And uh, whether it's instant messaging. Um, so, you know, when, when, I, was, when I was young, which is, gives away my age a little bit, I, I could write a letter to, to my friend, my Filipino friend in the United States, and it would probably take a week and a week and a half. They'd get it, and they'd take a couple of days to write it, and they'd, they'd send it back. So it'd be three weeks before I got a reply. And I was perfectly happy with that. But now, <clears throat> if, I, if I send an email, if, if somebody hasn't, and it's really, I'm very interested in it, and I hadn't got it back within, you know, 15 minutes, I'm starting to get a bit itchy. You know, what about SMS, um, Facebook um, uh, posts and things like that. And I guess the question is this, what about the earth? What about the earth? So we want to look at this, this idea of, of instant earth. You know, uh, once upon a time, there was, there was nothing. There was um, um, not even empty space um, in, in, this, in this region where we live, our sort of suburb we call home in the uh, cosmic uh, realm. But, you know, suddenly, bang, there was the earth. And the question is this, do you think it was possible for that to actually happen? That, that you, we went from absolutely nothing to, to bang, a, an earth that we, we know and love so well, or maybe not quite that same earth, uh, but quite similar. So I want to take you on a journey uh, with me uh, this afternoon. And we'll, I want to take you, first of all, to, to Lord Howe Island. Now, one of the, the things that I was asked to do when I arrived at the conference about um, probably about six or seven months in, I got a phone call from a guy called Clive in Lord Howe Island, and he said, could you come and do a week of uh, prayer, a um, week of prayer, week of spiritual emphasis in two weeks uh, to Lord Howe Island? I'm going like, where the heck is Lord Howe Island? Um, two weeks, you know, I've got all of these things in the calendar. And um, then I went on Google, as you always do, and Lord Howe Island and images, and it was incredible. I thought, yes, I can move anything on my schedule to go to Lord Howe Island. It's, it was absolutely amazing. Um, Clive took me out on a boat, or, or one of his um, business partners took me out on a boat um, out here and um, gave, gave me a snorkel and a few other people as well. I jumped in the water and the fish, absolutely amazing. Clive also took me around the back of the island and, and we saw incredible birds and, and fish as well. It was absolutely amazing. Um, the interesting thing, though, is flying into Lord Howe Island is, is very unique as well. So flying in, you, this is the, the plane that they use. It's, very, it's certainly not a 747 or A380. Um, you simply wouldn't be able to land on the island. So, so you come in um, and, and land on this airstrip, which is, just goes from one side of the island all, all the way to the other. And um, they, they really have to weigh everything that goes on board the plane. Um, because otherwise this plane not, may not fly. And if the weather's bad or something like that, they may actually chuck or, or toss, I should say, toss your, your baggage off board from underneath the, the plane. And so your baggage stays and you go. So you get to Lord Howell in this amazing place 
with only the clothes that you're wearing. And they say, oh, we'll bring it later. We'll bring it in a couple of days when the uh, um, weather gets better. But not only is the plain really interesting, I want you to focus on this mountain right here, Mount Gorman, it's called. And um, if you go a bit closer, you'll actually see um, that the, the mountain is actually made up of a whole lot of layers going all the way to, to the top. Not, I guess this might not be really, really obvious, but I'm sure you, you might have seen it in other places, maybe if you've gone to the Blue Mountains or something like that. And um, we drove down there and had a look. And it was this that first got geologists kind of curious, because they, uh, geologists and scientists love counting and things like that. They love, love nature and studying nature. And they counted all of the layers, on, not on this um, island, of course, but, but somewhere else, um, Grand Canyon and places like that. And they counted all the layers, and it was literally in the, the millions of layers, hundreds of thousands of layers. The other thing is that they did is that they, um, they, they watched and they saw how long did it take uh, for one layer to, to be formed, maybe not on this mountain, but somewhere else. And they, they worked out how long the, the, the rate of laying down these sedimentary layers took. So you do a simple bit of maths, and you say we've got hundreds of thousands of layers. Um, we've watched it take one um, year to, to lay down a, la um, a sedimentary layer. And suddenly they're going like, hang on a minute. I think we can actually work out how old this mountain is. And it works out to, to hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. And they're going like, that is the age of the Earth. It's interesting, though, if you actually dive into what, what is happening here, uh, because this was a, a real sort of change of par um, paradigm, paradigm shift um, that occurred in geology in the, in the um, 18th century. Because for, for hundreds of years, geologists had actually uh, believed what the Bible taught or believed what, what we find in God's word. And yet suddenly they saw, hang on a minute, there's, there seems to be a great shift and this was, the, this was the principle that they actually worked with um, to, to look at how old the earth is. The, the principle is this. We must take as the norm in our explanation of the earth's history the manner in which nature acts and produces solids at the present time. We know of no other way. And it was this guy here, the tombstone, um, George Fusel. And that's, that's what he put forth. This is the principle through which we work. Sounds very, sounds very simple, sounds very straightforward, sounds very rational. But can you tell what the problem of, with this principle is? Any, any thoughts? What might be wrong with this very principle? It doesn't allow for any potential change. What is uniformitarianism? Correct, yes. It doesn't allow for any potential change yes. in, in a sort of pattern of behaviour. Correct, yes. So, so basically, it doesn't allow for anything which we cannot observe right now, correct? So, so if we haven't observed it, we cannot actually calculate for it or even um, acknowledge it in our geology. And this, is, this was also Charles Lyell. This was a very famous um, person. And this, this guy here, Charles, lived around the same time as Charles um, Darwin. And he was very, very focused, very committed to moving away from, from the Bible. And Charles um, Lyle wrote a, a really um, influential book called the, the Principles of Geology. A um, little bit hard for you to, to read here, but I'll um, just expand it out. Principles of Geology being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. Very, very influential. Not many of us have actually may have heard of it, but it's um, similar to, to Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. It was that influential in geology. Now, of course, it's, it's um, great. You know, we, we all like geology. We love going to see uh, Blue Mountain, the Blue Mountains or whatever. And, um, of course, we, we're very interested in, in some explanations, but it's that last line which is really key. By reference to causes now in operation, same thing which we're talking about, that, that they're, they're taking the, the um, processes, the rates of change of things which happen now, and trying to project them back and say, well, that's how old the Earth is. And, of course, this, this was very, very influential. It started with all of those sedimentary layers, but it even, even went further. So they, they started to say, well, we can count how many layers there are, but what about the whole Earth? 
What about trying to, to work out how old the, the planet itself is? And they started on, on developing models. Now, there's one th very important thing to note, and that is you can't actually calculate the age of the Earth itself by the sedimentary layers because, of course, you can't go down and count all the, way, the layers all the way down to the core. It's, uh, it's molten lava, obviously. But in terms of they started to think about how could we do this. And one of the guys was a guy, Comte de Buffon, um, rather interesting kind of name. But he was a, he was a scientist, a geologist, um, a mathematician as well, in 1779, the 18th century. What he did is um, he, he decided he'd make this, this iron ball, this steel ball. Um, he would heat it up to, so it was really hot, and then he would cool it down until it came to the temperature which um, we would um, measure on the Earth today. And based on that, um, this, this gentleman here calculated that the age of the Earth is 75,000 years old. Fairly interesting, isn't it? 75,000 years old is, is his calculation. Now, the um, what's, what's the problem here? Of course, that's nothing like the, um, the dating that we'd have in science today. It's, um, it doesn't match with the Bible necessarily. It doesn't, doesn't match with science. What happened? What, what, what's different? Well, the key thing to, to note is this. Of course, it really depends, is the earth like a big uh, ball of iron or steel? The second thing as well is, how do we know what the original temperature of the earth was for it to cool down? And it's a very interesting problem. Now, of course, it didn't stop there. It went on. And we go, go to a very, very famous person by the name of Lord Kelvin. Kelvin was the, the person who was very interested in, in temperature and heat. And, um, of course, you've got the Kelvins. You've got Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. He, this is where we get um, uh, that way of measuring temperature. Now, he did a different model. He, he worked on a model where the whole Earth was a molten object, a little bit different kind of modeling. And he worked it out, did all the maths. How long did it take for that molten object to, to, to come down to the temperature which we have today. He calculated, Lord Kelvin calculated, that the Earth itself was somewhere between 20 to 40 million years old, based on this model. And he said, I, I'm, I'm confident, I, I, I believe it's between 20 and 40, and I'm absolutely certain it's close to 20 million years, years old. He was so adamant with this that he, he went on record um, saying that. But it's very interesting to note, you've got the similar problems with the starting points and the, the, the rate of change of, of the temperature of the Earth. But it's very interesting that he believed this so strongly, even, even to the point that he, he um, the issue that he had was this, that he didn't know about radioactive decay. He didn't know that there was a different form of energy production, where you could produce energy in the Earth, and so that's why he um, calculated it to be 20 to 100 million years old and um, believed it to be closer to 200 million years old. This leads me to a very interesting uh, point. Lord Kelvin, of course, was a very, very good scientist. He, he did a lot of good work, but he was absolutely adamant that the Earth was 20 million years old. Kind of reminds me of, of some scientists and, and geologists today secular geologists, who are very adamant about something else or about the age of the Earth and, and biological life as well. And the reason why he, he could, be, could be wrong about that calculation was because he didn't know of a process which could be in action in the Earth or has happened in the past. Does that, does that make sense? And the question is this. The question we have to ask ourselves is this. Scientists and geologists may be very confident now about the age of the Earth, the, their calculations, but is it possible there's a process at work? Or maybe to, to rephrase that, is it possible that there was a process at work in the history of this planet which we do not observe now, which would change the calculation for the age of the Earth? Does that make sense? So that's what we really need to take into account. So let's keep on going. So George Darwin, this was um, uh, uh, Charles Darwin's son. He did some calculations. He came out with 56 million years old. Of course, if you know your geology, still a long way off. Still a long way off in terms of, 
um, standard ge um, geology models. But then we moved to 1956, Claire Patterson. Claire Patterson realised that trying to um, age or date the Earth was a very difficult process. And so what he did is he said, I'm going to go to this crater where there's a meteorite, Canyon Diablo. There's this meteorite hit the Earth, and he found some rocks from the meteorite itself. And he thought to himself, <clears throat> I wonder how old those rocks are if we were to calculate them. And he, he did his, his calculations, and these rocks here calculated to 4.54 billion years old in, in terms of the models that they had. Very, very interesting. So, so um, you've got the Earth, difficult to model. You've got this uh, meteorite that hits the Earth, breaks up. You've got these bits of rock here, and these date to 4.5 billion years old. And he start, put them together. He said, meteorite, Earth, put them together. This is the age. What's the problem? What's the problem? Well, they, the obvious problem is this. How can you date the Earth by an object which has actually hit it? Make sense? You can't. You can't. They can be completely different um, um, ages. For, for example, I've got a, a Toyota Corolla in my, in my garage. Well, it's not in my garage at the moment. It's in the, the parking um, lot, the Wilson parking area um, just up the road. It um, was um, manufactured in 2005. So if you were to come to my house and say, I, I really, I'm finding it very difficult to, to put an age on Sven. He's, um, he looks too far too young to, to be uh, what we think he is. He um, you know, hasn't got enough grey hairs, but I do have some here. So we'll go into his garage. We, we will go to the, the, the car, and he opened the door, and bang, 2005. There you go. Sven, was, Sven dates back to 2005. It doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. But this is the date, this is the date that geologists and scientists actually put on, on the Earth. How do they do it? Let's, let's dive into that a bit. They do it by radioactive um, decay, by radiometric dating. And um, uh, this was the process that Lord Kelvin did not know about, did not know about. So he could not have this, an understanding that, that heat could be generated in the Earth in a different way. Of course, what happens with... Um, radioactive decay is you have something like uh, uranium, uh, which is a very heavy metal, uh, but unstable. And that's, that's where you, you get all your nuclear power from. So uh, uranium wants to sort of, it, it, it's like a, a top that's ready to kind of fall over. It's spinning, but, but it's kind of wobbly and wants to, um, to move to something else. So you go uranium down to thorium, you've got helium up there. You get all these different uh, particles and rays. It's a quite a long process, um, but it's, it's very interesting that this process has a very um, uh, fixed um, time um, element associated with a time dimension. It's kind of like, a bit like a clock, so it's kind of ticking away. And you've got a lot of different things which can decay. You've got um, carbon-14, very, very famous, obviously, um, decays down to nitrogen. And um, the, for, for these radioactive decays, you, you got this, this process or this quantity known as half-life, which is, say, we started with 100 atoms of carbon-14. Then in 5,730 years, um, it's down to um, 50 atoms. Then after another 5,700 years, it's down to 25. So it's half, it goes by half for each of these, these half-lives. For potassium going down to argon, uh, you've got 1.277 billion years, so much, much, much longer. And of course, you've got uranium all the way down to lead. So as I said, it's a long process, um, but it has a half-life of 4.468 billion years. Amazing if you're a geologist and you're looking at dating the Earth uh, based on what Claire Patterson did. And this is what Claire Patterson used. He used the uranium to lead dating uh, for that, those meteorite samples and he came up with the, the age of 4.54 billion years. Now, I want to, to just kind of dive into this, this process of your, um, radioactive decay. So I want you to come on another journey with me, and um, this time we're going to go to the Blue Mountains. So we're going to go away from the Lord Howe Islands, we're going to go up to the Blue Mountains. And um, there's actually canyons up in the Blue Mountains, I, I've, or in that, um, that whole mountainous region of New South Wales. 
And um, you, there's, there's places where, where you might be able to find some very interesting geological um, uh, entities, shall I say, things. And so let me, let's, let's imagine that we went for a canyoning trip and, um, and, and you happen to be a, a research team of geologists and you found, or I found rather, I found this, this thing in, in the Blue Mountains. So it's um, this glass thing it's, um, and the, the, it's full of sand, all this dead sand, and the sand is uh, dropping into the lower uh, part of, of this object. And I, I go, I watch it um, clicking away or ticking away. And I say to you as, as my team, I say, I'm fairly certain that this object is actually ca calculating time or it's, it's a measure, way of measuring time. And I say to you, this is, this is what I've got right here. And I say, I'm pretty sure that we could work out how long this has been going for. And I say to you as, as a research team, I want you to go away and actually find out when this thing started. Okay, so you'd go away, you'd go like, yes, we, we've got all of the, the instrumentation to actually work out how, how long this has been going for. So we start to do our measurement, easy measurements. So the, what's the measurements we do? Uh, first of all, we measure how much sand is in the top of that, that hourglass there. So, so we can actually calculate it. Of course, it's changing, but we've got the accurate um, instrumentation to do it. We also calculate the rate at which it's dropping down into the lower part of the, the, um, the glass there. And of course, we, we calculate how much is in the bottom. But being very careful scientists that we are, we don't want to leave any uh, rock and stone unturned. So we add a few, um, do a few other calculations. We determined, while we were measuring it, how much sand was added into the, the hourglass uh, while, while we were um, investigating it. And we also work out how much um, how much sand was actually lost. So, so we've got absolutely everything we can know about this sand, um, this hourglass that we, we have here. So you, you, come, you come back to me because you're really great uh, research assistants, great team. Uh, you come back and you, you show me with great pride, this is what we've calculated. We've got exactly, we know how much is in the top, how much is in the bottom, what's the rate, how much has been added, how much has been lost. We've got everything we need to know about it. And I go like, that's fantastic, really, really good. But I wanted to know when it started. You haven't calculated that yet. So you go like, oh, darn. So you go back to the, the research lab and you think about it. And you go like, how do we measure that? And then suddenly you've got a brainwave. You've got the brainwave. Because what you could do is what if all of that sand was originally all up at the top? Then, of course, that makes sense. Then we can tell how it's going. I mean, it's simple. It's a simple calculation. So what we do is we do this. We have the assumptions. We have in the top was 100% originally. The, we assume that the, the rate is constant. We assume that originally the, the bottom, uh, this, the amount of sand in the bottom was 0%, so there's nothing in the bottom uh, of the, the hourglass. We, we assume that nothing's being added in because it's all closed there. There's, there's no... There's no openings to it. And in the bottom, of course, there's no holes there as well. So it's lost. So we're on a roll here. We, we crunch the numbers and bang, we work out that this hourglass has been going for 4.54 billion years. Amazing. Come back and we go like, we've found it. We know exactly how long this hourglass has been going. It's incredible, isn't it? Incredible amount of, of ingenuity, amount of insight. What's the problem? What's the problem? Making assumptions. Exactly. Exactly. These are all assumptions. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. And this is what it's so important to understand is that in science, you can do a lot of measurements, powerful measurements, but in terms of, particularly with regards to the, the historical science, shall I say, these assumptions need to be made. They're, they're what we call initial conditions. They're, they're the, the things which the, the system, the, the hourglass started with, and you can never measure them. You just need to assume them. If those assumptions are wrong, then what else is wrong? The, your age as well. It's absolutely, absolutely wrong. And there's no way that you can find those out. Absolutely no way you can find it out. So the other thing, of course, is that 
um, it'd be interesting to, to figure out, is there anything in this, in this Earth which would actually tell us that maybe this planet is not 4.54 billion years old? Well, let's have a, have a look at that as well. So I'll go, go back. I was, I was jumping ahead. Let, let me say this. Let, let's say that there's a person here in this audience or, or um, who is part of that team and said to me, Sven, that was a really simplistic calculation. That y- you should know better. You know, you, you went, you've been to, to university overseas. You know, there's, there's so much more sophisticated kind of techniques to work out the age. And there are. But the interesting thing is this. So this is one of them. This is the Concordia diagram. So this is looking at your uranium lead, uranium lead. And it's interesting what they do is they not only have one hourglass, they take two hourglasses and they start to compare them. And they get a, a, um, uh, a curve like this. And one of the things that, that they say is this. This curve here can actually tell us when there was a loss event, when, when some of the, the uranium was lost or, or lead was lost. The problem with this is that even though this is a sophisticated technique, the issue is this. That those initial conditions are still assumed that point at the, um, at the zero point in the graph. And the other thing as well as this is that while it might be possible to find out single loss events, if there's multiple loss events, this diagram doesn't work it out for you. You can't solve it. So while it may be sophisticated, it's actually hiding the fact that we still cannot measure the initial conditions. We still cannot detect all of those loss events. Okay, so that's Concordia. What about there's another technique called the isochron? So it's getting pretty messy, isn't it? Getting pretty messy. But what happens here is that um, they they calculate a number of different uh, measurements for the clock. But once again, there's there's this, this issue that they are assuming the initial conditions right across here. If the line started like here, the isochron still doesn't solve it. So you've got this sophisticated technique, but it still doesn't solve the fundamental problem that we have. As I was saying before, is there anything on this planet which would suggest that this this planet is not as old as 4.54 billion years? Well, let me give you a few just to kind of pique your interest and get you thinking. One of the things is this, is that the sea is not salty enough. The sea is not salty enough. You know, every single year, there's 450 tons of sodium pours into the sea. Through You've got the rivers that are washing down um, the, all of the, the soil and the salt and all that kind of stuff. The thing is that only 27% of that salt, the sodium, leaves the ocean. So there's currently, at the moment, there's four, 14, 700 million, million tons of sodium in the ocean. It's amazing, isn't it? So much sodium. But the fact is this, if the earth has been around for billions of years, then the sea should be so much more salty than it is. Okay, that's one piece of evidence. What about another? Another one which is really cool is uh, diamonds. Diamonds are the uh, girl's best friend, aren't they? But they're also um, a uh, Bible-believing creationist best friend as well. Because this, um, diamonds, they've they've measured diamonds, and there's actually carbon-14 being found in diamonds. Now, the issue is this. If diamonds are millions and billions of years old, as they're calculated to be, remember I said that the half-life for carbon-14 is 5,000 years, which would mean that 10 um, half-lives is 57,000 years. There should be no carbon-14 in diamonds at all because the the, the carbon-14 would have all decayed down to nitrogen. The other thing as well as this is that diamond is, one of the, is the hardest substance we know on Earth. And so to actually introduce carbon into those diamonds is impossible. So it's all lost, uh, all decayed down to nitrogen. And yet we still have carbon-14. It's an amazing, amazing thing to consider. There's also the reality that the Earth's magnetic field is decaying too fast. So we're, we're on a pretty amazing sort of... Um, um, position here on Earth. We, we've got, it's a pretty good deal, really, because we've got this huge sun which is pumping out all of this energy. And yet, at the same time, if, if the sun was just pumping it straight at us and there was nothing protecting us, we, we would literally uh, burn up. But it, we've actually got this magnetic field which deflects the, the rays of the, um, the sun or the heat from the sun. And so this, the, these, just like a big magnet, 
um, th these, this magnetic field really uh, protects us in so many uh, ways, except this magnetic field is um, decaying. It's decaying uh, fast. And if it had been decaying so fast at the rate at which it is decaying, if the Earth has been around for billions of years, then it should have all simply gone away. Another really important point um, about why the Earth might itself might be younger than what science says. What about the Bible? I told you we'd be coming to the Bible. And I want to take you on a bit of a journey here and to, to look at the Bible. You know, there's, there's a psalm, a song in the Bible which says this, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. That's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. That God could go, let there be an earth. And instantly, remember I said instantly? Instantly, there's an earth. We're not talking about a molten object. We're not talking about um, debris from, from solar systems. No, we're talking about something which God created simply by speaking it into existence. And the Bible actually tells us that God did that with the universe as well. We find that in Hebrews as well. But let me, let me come on a journey with me because this is absolutely fascinating as well. You know, the Bible tells us, so we're looking at the bi biblical data. The Bible tells us, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's the, that's the, the summary version that we have of, of creation. Amazing that God made the heavens and the earth in, in six days. And we find this when we actually go back to the Genesis account. If you want to, to have a look at that, um, in the Genesis account, it's, it's a um, 31 verses, so we don't have time to read it. So go home and read it this, um, this evening. But there's a very interesting thing that we see here. It, it starts off by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it goes through. It, it says, God said, let there be light. Let there be a firmament, let there be land, let there be plants. We've got double plants there for some reason. Um, I was typing too fast. Uh, we've got the sun, the moon, and the stars. We've got fish and birds. We've got animals and human beings. And then at the end, at the start of, of um, Genesis chapter 2, just before we introduce the Sabbath, it says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And then it goes on to say, God bless the seventh day and made it holy. That's why we meet here today, because God blessed this day, the Sabbath day, and made it holy. But very important, notice, it says God created the heavens and the earth, and then at the end, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. This is like bookmarks, kind of bookmarks, which actually tell us, or sorry, not bookmarks, uh, bookends, I should say, or like a sandwich, which puts it all together, that the whole sandwich actually fits in six days. It's really, really amazing. And the interesting thing is this, is it's not only in the first chapter of Genesis and in the Ten Commandments, it's also in Exodus 31, verse 17 as well. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. This, the conclusion is this, the conclusion is this, and this is amazing, is that everything in Genesis 1 fits within the six-day creation time frame. Absolutely amazing that God could create a bang, there's an earth. Absolutely amazing. Now, I know that there's probably Bible scholars amongst us who, who've kind of looked into this uh, before, and I want to take you on a little bit of a, a um, journey with you as well on this too, because sometimes people will say, um, sorry, let me, let me share with you this, um, the quote from Jacques Ducan. Jacques Ducan is a French Jew who became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And um, so he's a person that knows Hebrew like it's, it is his mother tongue. It's, it's like asking me about English. I'd, I'd know what I'm talking about if you asked me what it meant. This is what he says. From my perspective, this whole idea of gap theory raises serious philosophical theological problems and, more importantly, cannot, be seriously, cannot seriously be defended exegetically. It's clear to me that the Bible text does not imply any kind of gap theory. And they're talking about sort of finding a gap in Genesis chapter 1, particular, particularly with regards to the, the second verse. So it's absolutely amazing that, that Jack Ducan would say, you cannot find it in the text. 
It cannot be defended exegetically from the text itself. Now, come, come with me. As I said, some of you uh, may have really studied the Bible. Some of you may have versions of the Bible which would, would kind of point in a slightly different direction. And, and people might say, but hang on a minute. Isn't the first day, isn't that when, when the Bible says, let there be light? Isn't that the first day? So, so notice here, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And there, then it tells you about that. And then at the, um, the end it says, and there was evening and there was morning, the first day, or a day, the one day. So isn't, isn't that the description of, of the, the first day of creation? So, so, so aren't we sort of trying to pack too much into the, to the first day? The interesting thing is this. Of course, one of the things which people will point to is they'll say, um, all of the other days, day two, three, four, five, six, not the seventh, but two to six, all starts within God said as well. But I, um, so doesn't that kind of make sense? Doesn't that sort of point to a um, literary kind of structure and pattern that we would see here? But I want to take you on a little bit of a, a logical kind of reflection, shall I say, just to, to, to pique your, your ideas. The Bible describes the day, this is the biblical definition of a day, as an evening and a morning, right? That's the biblical definition of a day. So, that was true for the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day. I'm belaboring the point there, aren't I? But let's go back to the first day. For the person that says that the, the first day started with and God said, let there be light, is effectively saying this. Right over on the corner there, um, um, God said, let there be light, and there was light. What's the problem with this? Sun hadn't been created yet. Sun hadn't been created, yes, there's a... There's a challenge there. Yes, any other points? We can't see any problem you can't see any problem with that? No problem? Okay. Any other? Uh, sorry? What the Bible says. What the Bible says. Yes, any, any other thoughts? Yes. God is separated darkness from the light. Yes. Presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, and yes. The the sure, sure. The point is this, is that the person that says that the first day began with God said, let there be light, has a problem because the Bible says that the first day began with the evening. Does that make sense? So the first day is about darkness, but you're, you're, you're saying that the first day begins with light. And this is much more of a fundamental logical problem, even the sun being um, existed or being created on day four. It's, and and it's, it's amazing to really think about it. So the much more logical, much more meaningful understanding is this, that that's the point at which God said, let there be light. The start of the first, the first morning. Does that make sense? That's the, and that's what we see in the text. Now, sure, exactly. Yes, correct. Yes. And that's a very important. So to come back to, to your question here, the important thing to remember is that God is not dependent on the sun to create light. Right? And, and, and look, that, that's not trying to pull sort of like uh, funny biblical tricks here. Because can any one of you see the sun right now? No. Is there light in this room? Yes. And that means that we can have a source of light which is not necessarily the sun. We do it all the time. We do it all the time. And God is not dependent on the sun to, to create Light. He can do it himself. As you said, his very presence, he can create light. And you see that in Revelation, when, when there's no more need for sun, and, and yet you still have light. It's the presence of God himself. Now, this is the very interesting thing. When was the evening? In the text itself, it's this point. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. See, that's the first evening. There's only one description of the nighttime in Genesis chapter 1. It's verse 2. That's the evening of the very first day. And that follows from the, the, the Hebrew has a very direct, very, a straightforward way of, of telling the story. And it's a sequential kind of thing as well. Sequential, sort of one thing follows after the other. It's this one which makes more sense uh, for, um, when you really start to analyze it. And of course, if we look at the, the New Testament, we, we go to the Bible itself, compare Bible with other Bible passages. The Bible actually says this. 
And you, Lord, talking about Jesus, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the, work, the heavens are the work of your hands. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. That means in, in Genesis chapter 1, God created this, this planet, this, 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 this whole earth, because that's when God laid the foundation for, for the earth itself. Absolutely amazing. And you find that in a number of other texts as well, in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, this, this, this focus on the fact that God created, God made the foundation of the earth right back at the beginning of creation. So where does this biblical evidence kind of point? And this is where I sort of feel God leading me. So just to, to be honest and open with you, I, I have this deep sense that as I read through Scripture, what, what it's saying is this, is that planet Earth was created at the commencement of the creation week and is only about 6,000 years old. Of course, that depends on how we date creation, but it's, it was at the beginning of creation week. Number two, the sun and the moon were created on day four of the creation week, as, as we were referring to uh, before. So when we put it together, the Earth, the sun and the moon are all only about 6,000 years old. Absolutely amazing. And why can that be true? Why can that be true? It's based on the very fact that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and all-loving to the point where he will reveal with, with clarity, with openness, what he did uh, for this, this planet. You know, there's, there's a, a real gift that the, the fountain in the city and um, <clears throat> all of the other sister churches like fountain around the world has, and that's a prophetic gift prophetic insight. And I just want to share with you from the book of education, which is really relevant here at uh, Fountain. It says this, inferences erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have, however, led to supposed conflict between science and revelation. And in the effort to restore harmony, interpretations of scripture have been adopted that undermine and destroy the, the force of the word of God. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the mosaic record of creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to co accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. Such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. Of the first day employed in the work of creation is given the record the evening and the morning were the first day, Genesis 1 verse 5. And the same in substance is said of each of the first six days of creation week. Each of these periods, inspiration declares to have been a day consisting of evening and morning like every other day since that time. In regard to the work of creation itself, the divine testimony is he spoke and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. With him who could thus call into existence unnumbered worlds, how long a time would be required for the evolution of the earth from chaos? In order to account for his works, must we do violence to his word? You know, I just want to take you back to that verse in Hebrews, and it says, And you, Lord, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. May God bless you as you continue to study his word. And, um, you know, I want to conclude by the fact that this, that our planet Earth is a miracle being created by God. What an incredible, incredible work of God. And if you wanted to have any more chat with me, I'm happy to, to talk to you over mobile or email, uh, Facebook as well, I guess, as well. But over to you. Well, one of the things we have in your favour, Sven, is that you've finished on time, so that'll make you welcome back. <laughs> well, we've got question, we've got question and answer time. Question and answer time. We, <laughs> no, can, no. we can do that. We can do no, that. I'm sure. No, yeah. Thanks very much. Very clear. I really, really appreciate the, the way that you've come down very firmly on the side of the Bible, mm. and uh, I agree with you that you know, any evidence that we look at must be looked mm. at in light of the biblical perspective. Mm. Mm. And I think as Christians, we're safe on that foundation. So mm. thanks very much, Sven. No uh, we'll just dismiss you with a, a prayer and we're going to have a...
20 or 30 minute break and we look to see, see you back here at 3.30. So I'll let you do the honours. Uh, okay. Have a no prayer problem. for us. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you that, that you have revealed to us your incredible work, your incredible work of creation, that this, this planet, the, the, um, the beautiful um, oceans, the, the mountains, everything was originally come from your hand. You created simply by speaking it into existence. And we want to, to thank you not only that, that you revealed in your word how you create it in, in the most direct way that, that you could, but you also revealed yourself to us in Jesus. Thank you that, Jesus, you're not only our creator, but you're also, you're also our saviour and friend. And Lord, I want you to pray for any person here. Lord, Lord this, is, this has been an amazing journey for me to dive into the Bible and to, to find out these incredible gems, um, so to speak, from the earth. But Lord, I want to pray for any person here who may be, may be struggling, may, may still have questions. Lord, I, I pray that, that you would bring a, a sense of peace. But you've also promised in the Bible that you, you would give us the spirit of truth, which would guide us into all truth. And I want to pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would guide us as a church and us as individuals to know you for who you really are, that we can give you glory as creator, redeemer, and saviour and friend. This is our prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.